this epic adventure, we take to the skies to explore mysterious ancient petroglyphs, the largest in the world, and stay at a literal oasis where we explore the deserts of Western Peru. We buggy over coaster-like sand dunes and get our adrenaline pumping as we take to the slopes on boards before waiting out the perfect desert sunset. We head to the coast and explore islands teeming with bird and marine life that produce a surprisingly highly sought after byproduct that started a war between the surrounding nations. Finally, we arrive in the nation's capital where we visit the most beautiful areas of town, undertaking a cycling tour and learning about its societal and historical uniqueness also what makes it one of the culinary capitals of the world. Join us in Peru, Nazca to Lima, via Hoca China and the Ballestas Islands. We continue from our previous video where we explored the UNESCO World Heritage and Cultural Capitals of Cusco and Arequipa. From the Arequipa region, we head down from the Andes to the coastline of the region of Ica. So we have something very special in store today. We're going to take a flight, so we're heading to the Nazca airport, and we're going to see the largest geoglyphs in the world, built between 500 BC and 500 AD by the Nazca civilization, and these are the famous Nazca lines. After departure, it didn't take us long to spot the first of the famous Nazca lines. Out of the etchings in the desert appeared the clear outline of a whale, followed by a strange looking figure nicknamed the Astronaut, a name catering to conspiracy theorists. One of the more iconic figures, the monkey with its spiral tail, followed by the dog and the hummingbird. After the spider appeared a questionable parrot, a lizard, and a tree, along with an odd figure or shape with large hands. There were other figures, of course, but at this point the nausea of being tossed around in a small plane overtook the desire to get great footage. An interesting point was spotting the wells used to source water in the desert. Okay, so just a little quick summary from today. I didn't really give much information earlier because we weren't really exactly feeling the best. I did the Nazca flights back in 2014 when I was here and I told myself up on that small plane I would never do it again. And somehow, you know, you forget things. The Nazca lines, aside from the nauseousness of the flights, are pretty spectacular. What do you think, Miranda? Oh, 
absolutely. <laughs> they were absolutely amazing. Made by the Nazca civilization here in southern Peru, which is a pre-Incan civilization. So this goes back before the age of the Incan people. And the way that they created these Nazca lions was by clearing the dark burnt stones or dark burnt soil on top of the actual desert scape and creating these pictures basically in the landscape these geoglyphs now people theorize how they were created or why they were created and a lot of people say things like that they were created for the aliens because obviously they can only be seen from above uh there are these big giant triangular sort of features that people are saying are ufo uh, landing strips a lot of those sort of things are conspiracy theories the real reason, or at least one of the, the main theories that makes some sort of credible sense is that they were actually made for worship, potentially for the gods above to be seen from above, but mainly during times of drought, most likely they would have been made in order to pray for the rain. So a lot of these animal symbols are something that uh, these people associated with uh, fertility and with a lot of water, a lot of the different animals that come to the area when you know times are great, when there's plenty of water, so that's their way of saying to the gods, we need more of this. We need more of this. And uh, obviously being in the desert, they do get a lot of times of drought. So that's most likely what they would have been for. But we will only speculate until, you know, we actually find the truth, if ever, because obviously a lot of this history uh, has disappeared. We are no longer in NASCAR. We have got a uh, three hour bus ride up to a completely different place. You might notice that I'm standing in a tent right now because we're staying in an eco camp here in the Wakachina Desert in Ica. I'm gonna show you where we are. Some sand dunes in the background there. Nestled between the biggest sand dunes in South America, it is the only natural oasis on the continent and a tourist mecca for adventure activities. Vodka, rum, and uh, pisco in it with orange and grenadine. Good luck. It's alright. It tastes like a fire engine. According to local legends, the water and mud of the area are therapeutic. Both locals and tourists often bathe in the waters or cover themselves with the mud in an attempt to cure ailments such as arthritis, rheumatism, asthma, and bronchitis. Right now we are in Huacachina, which is this beautiful oasis in the desert amongst the sand dunes on the west coast of Peru. And right now we're just chilling, but later we plan on doing some sand bugging and sandboarding in the sand dunes. Legend holds that the lagoon was created by a beautiful native princess. She removed her clothes to bathe, but after looking in a mirror, she saw a male hunter approaching her from behind. Startled at the intrusion, she fled the area, leaving behind her mirror, which turned into a lake. The folds of her mantle streaming behind her as she ran became the surrounding dunes.
All right, Chicky, you ready? Let's do it. The buggy was surprisingly thrilling, with steep drops and turns, and the views absolutely stunning. With our adrenaline running high, we were ready to face the dunes head-on without the protection of a vehicle. After some small practice slopes, we headed out to the larger dunes in the desert, some of the largest on earth, reaching up to 500 meters or 1600 feet. The setting sun over the desert was magnificent and unforgettable. We took some time to relax and watch the vibrant colors change in the sky under the fading light. Before our long journey back under the full moon, guided by the distant lights of the city of Ica. Cuisine right here. We have the chalfa mariscos, which is like a seafood and rice, of course. Um, the chicharron, hipota, 
which is calamari fried, and the ceviche, the pescado, so fish ceviche. And Miranda has the very Peruvian nachos. <laughs> this is beautiful though, this rooftop. The following day, we head to the coastal town of Paracas. Chicky. We're at Caramba in Caracas. It's a cool atmosphere. It's the best part. Nice. The whole ocean there for us to eat. Islands. What are we gonna see? Sea lions, lots of birds, boobies. Boobies? which is the candlestick and it's etched into the side of the hill there and it's made by the Paracas culture which was a pre-Inca culture in fact pre-Nazca culture it used to etch things into the rocks much like the Nazca people did. There are a lot of theories about what the candelabra is which is why it gets the name candlestick. Some people say it was Poseidon's staff, some people say it was a, a sign by pirates during the colonial era. Some people say it was aliens, but in all likeliness, it's most likely a San Pedro cactus, also known as peyote, which was used during these ceremonies back in the pre-Incan times. And the practice people were so advanced, they used to operate brain surgeries. They found over 450 mummies with these uh, cracks in their skulls, so they would have used the San Pedro cactus maybe as some sort of anesthetic during these sort of practices. Now, the original plan was to go out to the Bay Estes Islands, but our guide was saying due to uh, the avian bird flu in the area, the uh, bird life there isn't so great at the moment. It's about 1% of what it normally is. So he's suggesting we go out to some different islands up here and check out some of the bird life and wildlife there. At only a fraction of the normal abundance, the bird life was phenomenal and the large flocks of cormorants and seabirds seemed never ending. In the distance, we could see the famous Chincha Islands, famous for the Chincha Islands War between Spain and its recently independent colonies of Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Chile over the valuable byproduct of the region's abundant bird and marine life. Also known as the Guano Wars, the conflict began with Spain's seizure of the guano-rich Chincha Islands in one of a series of attempts by Spain to reassert its influence over its former South American colonies. These wars took place between 1864 and 1879. They were a precursor to the War of the Pacific between the South American nations that drew up the current national borders, which is still a topic of controversy to this day.
Guano, from the Quechua word Wanu, is the accumulated excrement of seabirds or bats. Guano is a highly effective fertilizer due to the high content of nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, all key nutrients essential for plant growth. To a lesser extent, guano was also sought for the production of gunpowder and other explosive materials. The 19th century seabird guano trade played a pivotal role in the development of modern input-intensive farming. The demand for guano spurred the human colonization of remote bird islands in many parts of the world. Unsustainable seabird guano mining processes resulted in permanent habitat destruction and the loss of millions of seabirds. Demand for guano rapidly declined after 1910 with the development of the Harbour Bosch process for extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere. Guano is now being mined at a sustainable level on the Chinchas Islands, and the nearby Ballestas Islands are now a protected area. This is an important sanctuary for marine fauna like the Guane Guanao cormorant, the blue-footed booby, and the tendril. Other notable species include Humboldt penguins and two varieties of seals, fur seals and sea lions, amongst other mammals, all of which we saw on our boat cruise. interesting we just uh, got off the boat there for the uh, the Ballestas Islands they've got this sort of street festival going on here there's a, a parade with drummers and people waving Colombian flags so I'm not sure if it's a, a Colombian national day or something like that but we're here in Peru how was the uh, the island trip Miranda? Oh it was awesome I'm really happy they chose to bring us to the island that they did because it was just Teeming. With teeming. Teeming with wildlife. Teeming with birds. We had the cormorants. We had boobies, which are the Peruvian boobies. Not these types of boobies, but the flying kinds. Humble penguins. Humble penguins was interesting. And these islands were filled with these birds. Miranda didn't feel too well there. Uh, I didn't get sick, but I was about to. <laughs> How was the smell? <laughs> um, the smell of the guano. I think it was the mixture of just the motion and the smell of the guano for me. The guano really, is the big it thing as the island strong. and the island itself has uh, like all of the uh, the bird poop all over it which is why it's a highly prized place all of these islands so that was Paracas that was a great experience we're gonna head up to Lima now this is the end of our trip in Peru so we'll basically go up to Lima we've got a few days up there and then we say goodbye to South America for a little while so delish Says so the custard apple and mango smoothie. Oh. With coconut milk. 
at, at Frusion, right? What's the name of this place? Yeah. Last bus. Last bus, right? What do you think of uh, Cruz de Sur? Oh, I really like this bus company more than others, even though they did charge extra for our excessive. So what do you think of our apartment? It is so luxurious. We did a really well job picking this one out. And it also has a private pool too, or at least you need to reserve and the pool becomes private up on the top deck. So we'll reserve that for tomorrow. We're in an area called Barranco. And it's the the coolest or the classiest area apparently in uh, Lima, or at least the hippest area they say, with all the universities and uh, cafes, bars, all that sort of stuff, restaurants. We just got our last bus. <laughs> I know it's crazy. Our last, it's our bus. last stop in South America before we go to the states. Yeah, and um, the company was, what was it, Cruz del Sur? Cruz del Sur. They were all right, yeah, they were nice and comfortable, the buses. Very comfortable, absolutely. Yeah. You can lean all the way back and put your feet up a little bit, so very spacious seats. Why don't you talk a little bit about how we booked the buses? We booked them all through Bamba, um, which is a company that pretty much... You can book like a package. We booked a Flexi Pass package where it includes transport and some activities. So um, through them, we booked a lot of the buses and also a lot of the activities like the Biasis Islands um, boat tour that we did today. And they've been pretty good and responsive throughout the whole experience. It's like a chat sort of system, right? Yeah, you go on an app and you request the bus or you request the activity that's included in your package. And you can also add things onto your package as you go to. And it's completely flexible, so you can choose however long you want to stay in each place. Um, but yeah, it's super easy. You just request through the app. They say, yep, yeah, that's been booked in for you. And that's pretty much it. It's been a really easy experience. And they choose all the best buses and the best tours too. Yes, the and they chose the best spots on the bus for us. <laughs> We've noticed that they always gave us the best seats, like either like all the way in the front, like on the bottom with lots of extra room and stuff like that. So, yeah. and yeah, they've been they super good to deal with. The only thing is some itineraries for the activities are a bit outdated. We noticed that some are pre-COVID, but we gave them that feedback and they were so receptive of it. So Absolutely. overall, yeah. I'd say it was pretty worth it. It made our lives a lot easier to yeah. put things through them. Yeah, hopefully they'll update some of those itineraries as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What do you think, babe? It's beautiful here. This is a beautiful area. <laughs> Okay, so it is our first full day here in Lima, Peru. We've got one more day after today. Miranda, what's the plan today? So today we are doing a cycling tour through Miraflores and Branca. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Private tour. I know. <laughs> Alrighty, so we've started our bike tour here with Aman and uh, we're traveling through Lima, Peru. Now, Lima is actually the third largest city in South America after Sao Paulo and Buenos Aires. Of course, it is a population of 12 million people. Now, it is the second largest city in the world built on a desert. And you might be looking around me right now thinking, this does not look like we're on top of a desert. Well, we actually are, but we're in the suburb of Miraflores, which is known as the wealthiest suburb in the city. And the reason why we have these beautiful green parks here is because all of these plants have actually been grown and reared in greenhouses and planted here, and they are regularly replaced because the soil underneath is composed entirely of sand. Now, that's one of the main differences here with the, the, uh, the region of Miraflores or the suburb of Miraflores and the surrounding suburbs of Barranco and uh, San Isidro is that these areas here 
receive extra protections, extra security here that operates 24 hours a day. We have CCTV cameras, we have cleaners on the streets cleaning up. Very, very different to some of the other parts of Lima. Now, this park we're in is called the 7th of June and it commemorates one of the battles that took place in the Pacific Wars. I did mention them earlier between Chile, Peru and Bolivia. And also it's a part of what is known as Kennedy Park, named after the US President JFK, John F. Kennedy. And that was because he actually visited this park here during his time as president. And after he died, they named the, the greater park area after him. Known also as the Cats Park, or one of the local names, because they have over 300 cats here that inhabit this park, due to a rat infestation that they had back here in the mid 90s. So people still come and pet the cats and feed the cats, which is kind of interesting as well. Oh, here's a Peruvian dog. Yeah. was just telling us as well what this bull represents and it's kind of interesting because we've seen these throughout Peru these bulls and I've always wondered what they are because you see the clay ones up on the rooftops and the windowsills you see it a lot particularly in Cusco and in Puno because they those are the uh, the Incan regions and uh, the tradition goes back to the Incas now of course bulls are not native to Peru they were brought over by the Spanish and when the Incas first saw the bulls they weren't sure exactly what they were so they called it Pucara and it's essentially what they would do is they'd make these little clay bulls, they'd paint them red and they'd use them as protection against the Spanish, or at least they, they thought that they'd protect them against the Spanish. And then later it evolved a little bit, they started painting them different colors for different reasons. And uh, the blue one here, it actually represents good luck. So it's good luck for the city of Lima. And if you touch the bull itself, it's supposedly supposed to give you good luck. So the bike lane we're on right now is actually one of the main roads here at Arequipa Avenue and they close it every Sunday until lunchtime just for cyclists and walkers and whatnot. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so behind me here we have the site of Waka Puyana, which was part of the ancient Lima culture. Somewhere between 4 and 400 and 700 BC they existed in this area here. This would have been the cultural center and this would have been the heart of their city that spread around here with a population of about 5,000 people at the time. Now after this period this area was adopted by the Wari culture and this became a cemetery for, for them up until they were defeated by the Inca people a few hundred years later. So this pretty much sat left to rot under the sand for hundreds of years until it was excavated in the 1970s and now people can come and visit these areas. Oh, and the bricks as well, they were built from clays from the sea, uh, the sea and also from the desert area here, which by the way being the actual soil of Lima. And you can see some little gaps in between the bricks there, they kind of look like books in a bookshelf and that's there for earthquake proofing just in case you know you have movement from the earthquake it's just a, a good way to sort of keep the building stable behind me is the iconic view that you generally see of Lima or at least Miraflores. It is, this area is known as the Malacon, which is uh, the raised area above the ocean. We're going to cycle along it now. It's pretty unique and you have these beautiful little parks that run all the way along looking over the ocean. It's absolutely stunning. This is probably the most iconic site here in Miraflores, which is the lighthouse. It was built in 1900 in Sweden and it was taken to Ica, which is down on the coast near Huacachino. We were a few days ago and it sat there until 1920. And then after that, it was pretty much in disrepair for quite some time. And uh, in the 1970s, they brought it up here to commemorate the Navy. So on the 8th of October every year, they commemorate the Navy of Peru, which is the most important faction of their uh, defense force.
So this is the most famous park in the Malacón region in Miraflores. It is known as the Lovers Park and it was designed by a man named Victor Delfin back in 1993 when he came to the park trying to figure out some ideas on how to design the park and he saw people doing this <laughs> behind him and uh, he knew that all the, the lovers would come to the Malcon to hide out and to hang out so he dedicated this park to them built the sculpture and uh, obviously we have this Gaudi style artwork down here with all little phrases of love on them which is kind of cool here right now in Parque Salazar which is actually named after a guy called Alfredo Salazar who about 90 years ago had to emergency land a plane right here in this park after it was malfunctioning and uh, luckily he was able to save everyone's lives so there is uh, there it is there is an actual statue um, with a memorial or a, a memorance to Alfredo Salazar but the other thing I wanted to talk about as well is this area is known for its food and in particular just down here behind me for three years, I should say, 2019, 2022, and this year, 2023, the best gastronomical destination in the world. And the reason is because of a fusion of different styles of food. First, we had the Peruvian styles of food, as I've mentioned in previous videos, contain a lot of these fresh vegetables that you don't get anywhere else in the world. The other thing is that we have a fusion of uh, history here. So we have the Chinese people that arrived about 150 years ago, infusing a lot of their styles of uh, cuisine, uh, such as the chow for the fried rice and the loma sotado, the, st the stir fry as well. So that's uh, it's called chifa fusion food. And then after World War II, we had Japanese people arrive here and infuse their styles of food as well with the Peruvian and the Chinese cuisine. So it's uh, become the most highly sought after styles of cuisine. We've got some of the best restaurants in the world, including the second best restaurant in the world, Central, which is the best restaurant in South America right here in Lima, and a whole bunch from the top 50 best restaurants in the world. So while we're here in Lima, we really want to take advantage of some of the really good types of food that they have right here. So we've got some great recommendations for some of the restaurants here that we'll check out uh, today and tomorrow. for a walk around Barranco but before we do I just wanted to point out some of this commission street art here um, and just explain a little bit about what it means so it says hagamos un Peru que nos de gusto which means we're making a Peru that we like and uh, there is a bit of a strong message here if you have a look under the tunnel there you can see uh, a celebration of multiculturalism where, whether it comes from the indigenous background of the Quechua and the Aymara or the African uh, background for the slaves that were brought here by the Spanish to the the uh, the Japanese and the Chinese immigration and the European immigration in the last 150 odd years. This basically shows all these people looking to the same point in the center saying that they look together towards a future united as opposed to apart, which I think is a really, really cool uh, message or symbolism. So that's basically where they want Peru to be going in the future and hopefully it does work out that way, but it's a really beautiful piece of art. historic part of Branco and this was the first settled area by the Spanish. We have the old church behind me here and then the new replica of that church in the background down there. Now we're about to cross a bridge called the Bridge of Sighs which is a 147 year old bridge with a 100 year tradition that the first time you cross the bridge you have to hold your breath. So Miranda and I are going to hold our breath see if we can get across the bridge. Let's do it. Deep breath Miranda. Easy. 
At the end of our tour, we returned to Miraflores to try some of its famous cuisine. While waiting in line for our table, we were distracted by a local street performance. Okay, so we're told by our guide that this is the place to go for seafood. Miranda's got the uh, the prawn or shrimp risotto done with the uh, the yellow pepper spice. Oh yeah, it's awesome. And this is the classic criollo ceviche, the spicy one. Provecho. <laughs> Good. Yeah, she's liking that. Criollo ceviche is really, really spicy. It's delicious. It's got the shrimp. It's got the fish. It's got the food part of the octopus and the calamari. Uh, we're at Punta, Punta Azul. That's the one. So we're just about to catch a ride to the Centro Historico in Lima, which is the historical center. And we're going to browse a few food options around there and then have dinner probably around here. Give me a go. What do you think? Oh yeah. It's rough. And this is the place here as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna advertise the place as well. De la Virgen Carmen. Churros. I have to say this, this is probably the best churro I've ever had. Look at that hot dulce de leche inside. Ooh. Look at that dulce de leche. They are so good. What do you think? Oh my goodness, so good. <laughs> Amazing. So we're right now in Plaza Mayor, which is the main plaza in the right in the middle of the Centro Historico region here in Lima. So this is probably the most famous Pisco Sour, not only in Lima, but probably in Peru. We're at the Hotel Bolivar here in the center of Lima, and this is the Pisco Sour Catedral. From here, we say farewell to Lima and adios to South America for now as we head to the USA for a wedding and to spend time with friends and family in Florida and New York, coming up in our next video. Video, if you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment, letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel, become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family, or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks, guys.